I thought today we'd take a look at some of the vintage goodies that are waiting for some love. There will be links in the description below for easy access to different sections of the video. Make sure you hang around till the end because I'm going to take a look at some upcoming videos, some projects we're working on, and we'll take a look at the shop. I thought I'd have the Mac SE30 project finished by now, but the universe had other ideas. Surprise! I managed to mess up a tendon in my wrist that's making long editing sessions almost impossible. While it heals, I thought we'd take a look at some of the retro goodness on the shelves that you see in the background all the time. And while we're at it, we'll take a sneak peek at some upcoming videos and some of the projects I've been working on. Starting right now. We'll start with all the printing antiques and vintage items like this Gestetner manual duplicator from 1889. You heard me right, 1889. These two hand cranked models work on the same principle and are from 1913 and 1950. Moving on to the 1980s, this Canon PC20 was the very first copier release that had a user replaceable cartridge. It was released in 1982, the year I graduated from high school. It formed the basis for the original Apple Laser Riders and HP Laser Jets that were released in 1985. Of course, there's also this HP LaserJet 2 from 1988 that I restored in our first videos, which I plan to try to print to from some of the classic computers that will be up shortly. There are a couple other Canon engine printers here, but they're from the 1990s, so I think they need to stew a few more years before getting some attention. I've also recently acquired a selection of early Commodore printers, including the MPS 801, 802, and 803. More interesting to me was this Commodore 1520 printer because the first printer I ever owned was one of these. In fact, I still have some prints of my assembly RPG that I printed in 1983. I have a few vintage calculators, including my grandfather's HP 45 that was refurbished in a previous video, and the HP 41C that was my daily driver from around 1988 until just a few years ago. I expect the next calculator video will be on this HP 15C that was my grandfather's daily driver up until the day he passed. There's also a couple of early TI calculators in the box, including this SR11. I love it because SR stands for Electronic Slide Rule. Before I get to the computers, let's take a quick peek at some vintage test equipment, including the 1916 Weston kilowatt meter that started my retro tech obsession in the late 1980s. This Tektronix 453A oscilloscope was Tektronix's first all solid state scope. Finally, there's an assortment of meters from Simpson, HP, and others, a pocket scope from the 1960s, and some odds and ends that I know little about. I really love the look of this Century Capacitor Tester. Do any of these stand out to you? If so, let me know in the comments. Of course, we have a lot of other bits and bobs. There is this classic Atari 2600 that my nephew likes to play. Sadly, it works perfectly and needs no restoration. I should have asked for my money back. It was supposed to be completely dead. I also have this Bally Fireball 2 pinball machine, which I restored in 2004. Fireball, I like you. Really, the only time I had over the years for major projects was this pinball machine and the construction of my main machine, which is painted with 1968 Mustang Midnight Metallic Blue Automotive Paint. Main Multicade. This thing is the best babysitter. Wait. Does this count as a retro tech project? It was certainly major. No? I suppose not. I also did find time to do simpler projects over the years. Funny enough, they would be done at the office in the service department on the very workbench I ended up bringing home and I'm using to this day. There are also a few old games, some tape players, old phones, including my very first cell phone, a few typewriters, and even a video editing suite. Mmm, sweet. One item I'm really looking forward to is this World War I era Sonora Baby Grand phonograph. This thing really fascinates me because it can play records at a decent volume without any electricity, 
What the f- The first computer I ever owned was a Commodore 64, like these two, which, along with this 1541 disk drive, were restored in previous videos. I still have one Commodore 64 that's untouched, but I'm undecided what to do with it since it's working well and looks virgin inside. If you have any ideas, please feel free to leave them in the comments. This 1702 monitor I picked up on Craigslist, and it seems to work fairly well. I do plan to restore it eventually, but will probably wait until I can get my hands on a 3D printer so I can include a new front door in the restoration. If Commodore is your thing, make sure you stick around to the end of the video for a couple of sneak peeks of projects I've been working on. And if there's anything you've seen in this video that you'd like to see me cover in a future video, let me know in the comments below. The Mac SE30 restoration project is coming along well, and as soon as my wrist is up to it, I'll get the existing footage edited and online. As you can see, it's pretty close to reassembly, and I'm dying to get it operating. After it is up and running, we'll take a look at some upgrades, including a floppy EMU and a blue SCSI kit. There's also the Osborne Executive here that we unboxed last year. There was not a lot of interest in it when it first came out, but that seems to have picked up, so I do have it on the short list for future projects. It needs the bad capacitors replaced, along with floppy drive rebuilds, CRT adjustment, and who knows what else. Stop the presses! This just in! While doing the final edits on this video, I picked up a Heathkit H89 at an estate sale. I think technically it's an H88 that's been updated with a floppy drive. Since I just picked this up today, I don't know a lot about it other than it's a kit machine from 1979 and it runs CPM on a Zilog Z80. How cool is that? Woohoo, another treasure. Oh God, another project. Finally, there's an entire empty shelf that will be getting a pair of new residents in the next month or two. But I'll leave it up to you to see if you can guess what they are in the comments. I have a few Commodore goodies that I may make a video on soon. If something looks interesting to you, then please let me know in the comments below because honestly, I've got way too many things on my plate. So a little help from you with the prioritization, that would be great. Some of the modern Commodore items that I have on hand include a Zoom floppy. That allowed me to read and back up my old discs, including my old RPG, on a modern PC. A UIEC SD that allows me to store all those discs on SD cards and use them on a Commodore 64 as if it was a standard disk drive. There's also the ever so popular Easy Flash 3 that allows you to access tons of programs, games, and alternate kernels in an easy to use cartridge. Then there's this interesting diagnostics harness that I picked up from Bill Pelton on the Commodore Facebook group. I've not tested it yet, but not having to deal with a mess of ribbon cables is really appealing. Then there is this vintage Centronix parallel interface that we need to use to try to print from the Commodore 64 to the HP LaserJet 2 from our earlier videos. I've also been considering a video on how to make a ZIF 64, a bread bin Commodore 64 with zero insertion force sockets for easy diagnostics. I'm sure there's plenty of videos on how to do this out there, but I really want to make one for myself, so maybe I should make a video out of it. One special project I've been working on is this prototype for a universal Commodore bench power supply. The idea is to have a single power supply on the bench that can power almost any Commodore computer that had an external power supply, plus one disk drive that had a brick, like the 1541-2. I think I've accounted for everything here, except the early Revision A VIC-20s that require 3 amps of 9 volt AC. Of course, we also still need to take a deeper look at Commodore HDMI solutions. I now have a RetroTINK 2X Pro and plan to build a rig to compare its latency with the inexpensive HDMI converter used in our earlier video. You can take a look at the budget HDMI solution on this video, or take a look at something more your style here. Thanks for coming, and I'll see you again soon. A UIEC SD, who named this thing? UIEC slash SD, product marketing genius.